<laughs> and boom, we're back with another episode of Elf Cast. I'm Mike Winter, and here as always with the illumined Dr. Bear Paul Lando coming to you live and direct from the great state of Jefferson, where freedom reigns supreme here on the Smith River. It's a gorgeous day. Uh, the sun is shining and not any hard frost this morning. So uh, I'm liking that. Uh, life is good here, Bear. Life is great. Um, can't be happier living in paradise. Uh, how's everything over in the farm today before we bring our guest on? Good. Uh, Deb and I were down at the river very early this morning because one of our water pumps went on the blitz. So we had to go figure out what was going on and uh, we found it up in a tree. So I'm going to go down there and fish a huge water pump out of a tree. Our river rises uh, quite a bit here, Jason. So you never know uh, what winter has in store for you. So that's going to be a fun afternoon, but it's a beautiful day. Oh, yes. Um, having an undammed river. Imagine that, how nature actually is supposed to work. Uh, it brings uh, always excitement every day. I always go check out the river every day uh, to see uh, if uh, it's a potential fishing day. I actually got uh, a little bit of steelhead fishing in uh, a couple of days ago. I know I had mentioned in the past shows I wasn't going to do it anymore, but it was calling me. Uh, it, there is something visceral about being out there in the river with my dog all by myself in the wilderness. Uh, taking on nature, and I do everything in my ability to be as safe as I can because it is catch and release, uh, but I, I just couldn't help myself, Bear. I had to get back out there, and nope, didn't catch anything, but I saw a couple old beastly salmon in there, <laughs> these old dinosaurs kind of rotting away, uh, but uh, such a pleasure living here, and just a quick shout out, we do have the Smith River um, Boatsmith uh, Whitewater Festival in two weeks. I'll be DJing Saturday night. We actually have a bunch of Alpha Vedic people coming up for that. If you guys want to see our beautiful area and are into whitewater rafting, you can uh, check out Boatsmith. Just Google it. There are still tickets available. You get to camp on the river and uh, hang out with us. Um, and depending on who's coming, Mike, who knows? Maybe even Bear will make a cameo. Mike, sorry to interrupt, but I think uh, Jason is having an audio issue there. Um, okay. Uh, let's see here. Um, you can hear me. Okay, bear. I can hear you. Okay. Um, Jason, maybe go look down in your audio settings. He was also having video settings before we were starting, uh, which is weird. Um, he can't and, hear you at all. So can you oh, type a message or okay. something? Yeah, that's a good point bear. <laughs> um, okay. While I handle him with this, if you want to entertain the audience, oh, he left. Maybe he's just coming back in to yeah, probably. Okay. Well, on that note, I might as well do the introduction here um, because I'm sure he's heard it a bunch. Um, and if you are new to Alpha Vedic, please uh, check us out on alphavedic.com. That's A L F A V E D I C.com. Also, you can join us on Telegram at t.me forward slash Alpha Vedic. And uh, of course, uh, you can join us on Patreon as of now at patreon.com forward slash Alpha Vedic. That's a way to uh, get a little more involved with us. We do have our executive tier where we do monthly Zoom chats with Bear and I. Uh, so if you are interested in getting a little bit more involved with Alpha Vedic and supporting us in that way, that is a great way to, to uh, start. Okay, Jason's back in. Let's hope that... Uh, okay. Um, technological. It's funny because uh, today we will be going into technology and the dualism of it. And maybe technology is, uh, Jason, maybe technology is giving us a little bit of sign today. Promethean, <laughs> Prometheus is in the wires. Uh, can you hear us now? Yeah, I don't know if it's Prometheus or rather Zeus who's in the wires right now. That's more <laughs> likely, I think. Either way, there's gr there's gremlins uh, gnawing at the wires of the internet, but it sounds like uh, you're good. So I'm going to go ahead and do the quick intro, and we will get this going. On this episode, Jason Reza Giorgiani, PhD, uh, founder and leader of the Prometheus Movement, takes us on a provocative journey to discern the possibilities that may unfold along our current tech tra trajectory. Was the Promethean mythology a harbinger of mankind's final conflict on this plane? Prometheus, of course, was the tragic figure who stole fire from Zeus in an act of heroic benevolence on behalf of humanity. Technology, some would suggest, is the allegorical fire of Zeus that has brought humanity to the present precipice of a tenuous future. Technoscience is a dual-edged sword to be certain. 
Will technology provide the solutions we seek or lead us to our ultimate demise through a technological singularity where robotics, genetic manipulation, and nanotechnology usurp man's presumed superiority? On this episode, Jason, PhD, the founder and leader of the Prometheus Movement, takes us on a provocative journey to discern the possibilities that may unfold along our current techno trajectory. He is an Iranian-American philosopher and lifelong native New Yorker. He received his BA and MA at New York University and completed his doctorate in philosophy at the State University of New York at Stony Brook. Dr. Georgiani has taught courses on science, technology, and society, the philosophy of Martin Heidegger, and the history of Iran as a full-time faculty member at the New Jersey Institute of Technology, Earlier, he taught comparative religion, ethics, political theory, and the history of philosophy at the State University of New York. He is a professional member of the Society for Scientific Exploration. From October of 2016 through to his resignation in August of 2017, Dr. Giorgiani was the editor-in-chief of Arctos Media and co-founder of the Alt-Right Corporation. Until his resignation in November of 2019, Dr. Georgiani was also a senior advisor to the Board of Trustees and Executive Committee of the Persian Renaissance Foundation. He is the author of eight books. His first book, Prometheus and Atlas, won the 2016 Book Award from the Parapsychological Association. He is also the author of World State of Emergency, Lovers of Sophia, Novel Folklore, Iranian Leviathan, Prometheism, the novel Faustian Futurist, and most recently, Closer Encounters. Uh, this is someone I've wanted on the chat uh, on AlphaCast for a long time. I've been, uh, we've actually had his books on our Alphavedic book list since I think 2018. And when they were first coming out, uh, and when I first discovered Jason's work, um, I was really blown away by the scope and measure of what he covers. It's really in tune with everything we do here. The whole reason why we launched AlphaCast was to bring to our community um, our, our thoughts and ideas on what real science should be, uh, the qualitative side as long as well as the quantitative side through the lens of Dr. Baer's work as a biotrained physician and through everything we do on the farm and through my work through decentralized technology. And of course, the grounding uh, foundation is philosophy, and we have a one of my favorite philosophers of our time today. Bear, I am very much looking forward to this one today. And you're muted, sir. <laughs> okay. Zeus at it again. Zeus at it again. Got it. Jason, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, I'm really uh, excited about this uh, this chat here. You know, to be honest, I wasn't aware of a formalized Prometheus movement. I was, of course, aware of the uh, the mythological, you know, story. Um, so this was really fun research searching into your uh, work this last week, and I have a lot of questions. and And I know a lot of our audience is already familiar with your work. And uh, so maybe we'll just start out with baby steps. Uh, sorry to do that to you, but maybe we'll start there. No, you know, just a, a side note, I almost ended up in Tehran uh, living there full time back when I uh, completed uh, graduate school. I was work teaching at the university level, and then I was offered a job at an English speaking school in Tehran um, for people that were over there in the oil industry. And then things kind of got wonky. That was in the early seventies, but uh, I was really excited about moving there and, uh, but it didn't happen. So that was my, my near story. So uh, maybe for the folks, if we could just get a little bit into what the formalized Prometheus movement is, what it's about, what the intended goals are and um you know and and perhaps uh how you went down this path in the first place and and uh, i sincerely mean it thank you once again for being with us today the audience i know is very enthused about having you here today it's my pleasure bear um uh, i'd be happy to lead in along those lines let me just uh, uh take a step back though for a moment and uh make one remark not to be a nitpicker on that fantastic <laughs> intro mike um but i think you you got that off my website which i have neglected to meant to update for uh too long and uh actually i've written two books subsequent to closer encounters so um after closer encounters i wrote uberman which was the second volume in a 
I call it a novel folklore trilogy. It's uh, you know, sort of a, a fictional trilogy of books. It begins in fiction and ends in nonfiction. Um, so I, Uberman was the second volume. And then the last of my books, the 10th of my books is Promethean Pirate, which came out, uh, I don't know, a couple months ago um, toward the end of last year. And so in any case, um, the Prometheus movement. So you want me to lead in with, with you know, why I founded that and what its aims and, and ambitions are and so forth. That's the trajectory you'd yeah, like to take. If you think that's a good starting point, but we're, you know, we're this is an open discussion. If you think uh, something else makes more sense, please. Well, I'm very much a philosopher in the style of Plato, who believes that philosophy shouldn't only take place in ivory towers, but should be a transformative force in the world. And uh, such philosophers, Heidegger was another one, um, have to take great risks in order to attempt to shape geopolitical and sociopolitical forces uh, in a way that is, um, you know, wiser, more sagacious, more, you know, that has more forethought than these forces would otherwise uh, unfold in the world. And so, you know, point being, you have to get your hands dirty to do that. And, and you know, Plato, despite having witnessed the example of his teacher, Socrates, uh, being martyred by the Athenian assembly and the founder of the order to which he belonged. You know, Plato was a member of the Pythagorean order. And so he also had as a precedent, uh, the burning of the Pythagorean schools, which probably cost Pythagoras his life. You know, the accounts are that either he was immolated in those fires himself when, you know, the, the, um, the masses of uh, Sicily turned against him and basically set fire to his schools because his, uh, you know, what he was teaching people there, including the many young women who were enrolled was threatening the traditionalist order of the society. So in any case, uh, Pythagoras, you know, was martyred and then um, Socrates uh, basically was, uh, you know, executed before Plato's own eyes. And despite that, he had the he had the courage uh, to go to Syracuse and attempt to turn this would-be tyrant Dionysus into a philosopher king, and he just barely escaped with his life. The uh, the court as I mean, this is the thing. You know, people look at the, these philosophers and they say, "Well, you should have seen this coming." As one might have predicted, the traditional court officials uh, schemed behind his back, and they thought that you know, rightly, they were going to lose control. Uh, and so they, they hatched a plot to have him executed and he had to escape Syracuse by boat in disguise in the middle of the night. Uh, so, you know, he just barely managed to save his own skin after that misadventure in Syracuse. And then of course, you know, we know what happened with Martin Heidegger who thought that he could reshape the Nazi party in a more constructive fashion and become a kind of, you know, um, philosopher king in the shadows, sort of, you know, uh, guiding various Reich's officials away from the trajectory that they ultimately did take, unfortunately. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm very much in that sense, a philosopher who believes in um, sociopolitical engagement. And so I founded Prometheism because I think that uh, we are right now being manipulated by a false dialectic that um, has as its aim the establishment of a totalitarian political system on this planet that's going to be extremely disempowering to humanity. And that false dialectic on the one hand is the promotion of soulless, materialistic, uh, reductionist transhumanism, which, which I find to be a kind of bastardization because if the idea of transhumanism is to transcend the merely human, right, in the sense that Nietzsche talked about the coming of the Ubermensch, uh, then this materialist reductionist transhumanism is hardly transhuman. I mean, because it doesn't acknowledge the spiritual nature of the human being. Uh, and so on the one hand, you have these characters like Ray Kurzweil and uh, you know, Yuval Noah Hariri and, and so forth, uh, basically, preparing the ground for us to be turned into cyborgs and for us 
to, you know, I mean, they actually don't even believe we have free will. How could they, right? They're determinists. So by definition, they subscribe to a physics paradigm, which has been falsified by, you know, 120 years of parapsychological research, not that they care, but, you know, they, they subscribe to a physics paradigm that in the first place denies that we have free will. So why would they care that installing Neuralink and other technologies into our brains uh, is going to potentially degrade our free will and turn us into a hive-minded Borg species, right? I mean, they don't think we have free will in the first place. And ultimately, they probably believe that, you know, uh, being able to control the masses of humanity is paramount as an objective, right? Which again is nonsensical because if you don't believe in free will, then the very concept of greater or lesser control over human behavior doesn't make any sense. But anyway, uh, so on the one hand, you have this, this reductionist, materialist, soulless transhumanism. And on the other hand, you have a reaction to it that is Luddite, it's anti technology, it's, you know, back to nature, uh, it's extremely. Uh, patriarchal, paternalistic, and in every sense, traditionalist, um, and tends to emphasize the unity of the great world religions in their most traditional or orthodox modalities, right? So the convergence of orthodox Vedic religion with, you know, Sunni legalistic Islam and, I don't know, orthodox Christianity uh, and so forth, and, that, and Confucianism, and so they have a sort of consensus of paternalistic uh, ancestral custom that they want to use as the basis for an anti-technology um, paradigm that will be used to deindustrialize the planet and bring us back into some kind of feudal system. And one of the most disturbing elements of this reaction to the soulless transhumanism is that it's also, it has uh, taken hostage the discourse of ecology and environmentalism. And, you know, as part of this false alternative, they are trying to make the case that the only way to save the environment is to deindustrialize and to basically go back to a, an agrarian feudal lifestyle, which I think isn't the case at all. Uh, there's all there are all kinds of technologies that can be used to you know uh, repair the environment, uh, repair the various ways in which we've damaged the ecosystem, and to promote uh, e an ecological way of life. So you have these two uh, false alternatives, this binary that's been set up. And frankly, at the risk of sounding like a conspiracy theorist, I think that although the vast majority of people involved in these two camps are unaware of it at the highest level, or if you wanna say at the deepest level, this is being done very deliberately. And the same people are behind both of these false alternatives. It's a dialectic that they're using to push us toward a global to totalitarian control system. And so I set up Prometheism as a, a response to that you know, uh, danger, to this vice that we're being you know, crushed by from both directions. Yeah, I so mean, is Prometheanism then, uh, would you consider it the middle way between the two? I don't like the term middle way, you know, I never have. Uh, I have a great <laughs> respect for Buddhism. I've always been very interested in the Buddha Dharma, but one thing that always rubbed me the wrong way about the Buddha Dharma was this term, the middle way. Uh, there's nothing middle about my way. You know, my thought is extremely <laughs> radical and uh, but, but yes, I take your meaning. Uh, in other words, it's the transcendence of a false, well, it's not even a transcendence. It's not falling prey to a false alternative. By understanding the true nature of the spirit of technology and how, for example, you know, uh, in the myth of Prometheus, when, let's say, Aeschylus says that Prometheus gifted humanity with techne, that the fire of, of the forge of Hephaestus that Prometheus steals from Olympus and gives to mankind is a symbol of techne. Techne is not just technology. The Greek word techne meant the arts and crafts. And so in very much the sense of Leonardo da Vinci and, and the other you know, artist scientists of the Renaissance, uh, Prometheus is as much a gift giver of the fine arts and um, 
of you know the aesthetic power of creation as he is a a, a bringer of uh, technology in the sense of tools and i think it's precisely the aesthetic dimension of uh, technological science the poetic and mythic dimension of technological science that needs to be retrieved so that we don't fall prey to this attempt to uh, instrumentalize human behavior and to, and to dehumanize us rather than to use technological science as a way to reach for a superhuman future. So I'm not sure if I read it from your work or somewhere else, but I've always looked at technology as a um, something that already exists in nature. And then, you know, of course, we bring it out in the technological form. I, I personally don't believe there's anything new under the sun. And uh, what I read, uh, again, not sure if it was from your work or not, was that um, technology ontologically predates science, which I would agree to. But is that what uh, you're getting at there or somebody was getting at? Yeah, this is a very radical idea, um, which, you know, frankly, I owe it to Heidegger. This is a, a part of my thinking that I'm adopting and adapting from out of Heidegger that technology, okay, so most people think of technology as applied science, right? That, you know, have, you have these scientists um, who are engaging in the development of various theories uh, and testing hypotheses. And then from out of that experimental research, based on abstract conceptualization, from out of that experimental research, then various inventions are developed. Um, and maybe, maybe not necessarily by those scientists themselves, but by, uh, you know, inventors and industrialists who are, uh, who are basing themselves on theories developed by scientists. So this is the idea that, you know, uh, theoria precedes praxis. And I don't think that's true historically, and I don't think it's true ontologically either. Historically, if you look at the, uh, the theoretical scientists of the Enlightenment, um, all of their work was made possible by and preceded by the uh, inventions and innovations of the Renaissance period. So, you know, it was the lens grinders and the telescope builders and people who made more complex um, alchemical equipment that then became chemistry apparatuses and so forth that made a theorization of various kinds possible. Okay, so the the uh, change in the modality of tool use is what made modern scientific theorization possible. And in particular, I think one key development was the manufacture of devices with increasingly complex miniaturized standardized parts that can and need to be replaced, right? So once you get these, you know, like Swiss clocks and watches that have these very small parts that are all that, you know, once, once one of them breaks in this gear work, it is replaced by an identical part. And so you have to have basically an assembly line, right? Of all these identical parts that you can swap in this clockwork it's at that point when you had the breakdown of these types of complex devices with standardized replacement parts that the idea dawned on these, you know, uh, 17th century scientists that maybe nature works the same way. And they developed the mechanistic model of the cosmos, which is, of course, false, based on uh, an experience of the breakdown of tools that were being manufactured. So from a historical standpoint, the idea that, you know, um, is, uh, science precedes technology is false. And then on an ontological level, I believe it's also false in so far as man was created by technology in the first place, right? Uh, hominids, pre-human hominids used tools in order to kill their uh, prey and in order to hunt animals that they would eat, and in order to ultimately, I think probably the invention of fire far predates Homo sapiens. 
uh, and the use of fire far predates Homo sapiens. And so once food is being digested, quote unquote, outside of our stomachs by fire before it's eaten, you have a process that's going to modify the human jaw, which is then going to, you know, over time change the shape of the human skull. And so between the evolution of the hand through tool use and the evolution of the human skull through the use of fire to break down food before it's even ingested, technology is creating Homo sapiens in the first place, right? And so, then, and then you look at the history of engineering and we see these vastly ancient cultures which had nothing resembling science, but which were capable of tremendous feats of engineering. So clearly there is a, an advanced technical know-how which is at work there, which is technological, but it's not yet scientific. It doesn't involve theorization. The, the indispensable precondition of science, scientia, as it was conceived by people like um, you know, Bacon and, and Descartes and so forth, is mathematics, mathematical theorization, and you know, being able to formulate things in terms of variables and make projections of states of affairs. And so there was nothing resembling that in these early cultures, but clearly they had a masterful grasp of tool use and engineering. So neither in, in, in a historical sense nor in an ontological sense, and by ontological, I mean like human existence in the sense of what constitutes human existence and how the human being emerges as a conscious entity at all. Uh, in neither of those cases is technology derivative from science, rather science is derivative from technology and made possible by it. Interesting. Oh, yeah. I'd also add that, no, go ahead, you go, Mike. I was just going to say tech, the etymology of technology far predates the etymology of science with the Greek techne. And, and also when you see the practical application today, you have whole departments dedicated to theory and then whole departments just completely you know, dedicated to the actual experimentation where they're compartmentalized. So in actual practice, the mathematicians and we see this with the ridiculousness of quantum, of the whole quantum theory and everything. Um, it's a, it's an, in a way a, a type of mysticism in itself, but the actual practice is not even um, of quote unquote science, doesn't even follow what they say. Um, the theoretics do not actually you know, connect with the actual scientific experiments. Uh, so uh, we see that, um, it, you know, it's quite obvious that what we're dealing with is a, sort of a mass uh, delusion. But in terms of technology um, and uh, for the historically, as someone who Bear and I both really appreciate the hermetic arts and the understanding of hermetics and that we live in a mind uh, based universe, that the grand technology is the human form itself. And, and I think those ancient men and women that were developing this stuff came from that basis. And so they literally used the human body uh, as a form of original science of testing on themselves. And so I think we could re kind of calculate what the term science actually means. And I think they've even hijacked the definition. And I think the true science is the alchemists understood that, it, it, that we're, we're talking about higher planes of knowledge and existence that come down from a different level and not the other way around where they look towards mathematics and then go from there. So anyways, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more though that the fact that the technology precedes science, I think Bear would agree with that too. Yeah, the only thing I'd add is that, you know, we talk about philosophy here and science here, but the, you know, the in the hermetic arts, um, philosophy was considered one half of the scientific equation and, uh, you know, they weren't separate parts. They worked in unison. And I would argue also that the philosophy is what adds morality to the, any scientific endeavor. And I think that's what we're witnessing now with pure reductionism as a lack of morality. Let me just uh, respond to that very specifically. Um, I would okay. reframe it as a lack of ethics rather than a lack of morality. Uh, I, I think it makes a great deal of difference. And here, here's why. Yeah, well said. The way I think about morality is very much as Nietzsche thought about it. Um, mm -hmm. mora moral codes are imposed from above and from outside, right? Moral codes are, they're like the Ten Commandments or like the law codes of Manu or whatever, you know, um, the Quran. <laughs> I mean, the Quran is a, that's really like the epitomizing example. 
okay, of a law that's dropped on you from above. Um, ethics is about the cultivation of character, both on an individual and on a social level. And basically what I'm arguing in Prometheus and Atlas and onward is that technological science has its own ethos that this idea that technology, technological science is value neutral and that it can be, you know, that basically uh, it can be used for any purpose um, and. Oh, we lost, we just lost your audio, Jason. Again, it cut out for some reason. Yeah, oh, bummer, what's going on here? Uh, <laughs> okay, he's going to come out and come back in. Wow, um, this is really interesting. The gremlins are at it today. Um, but he's making a great point, of course, about um, really that science isn't neutral, as they like to say, that it's not just numbers and uh, objectivism, that in fact, uh, there are power structures at play. And that's why we call it the cult of scientism, because it is the religion of our day. <laughs> Yeah, th this is a great talk. And, you know, when you get into mathematics, we make that as the, supposedly the language of the gods. But all it does mathematically is we reveal patterns. Mathematics are not the patterns. It's kind of like our talk, uh, you know, last night in the Walter Russell discussion. And uh, they're trying to make mathematics as a living thing out, you know, that predetermines everything. So I'll uh, get Jason's back. Yeah, uh, Jason, we were just kind of summarizing what you're getting at, and really what we're talking about is the cult of scientism, which is the religion of this day, uh, and how they try to uh, put forward that it's objective and neutral, and as you say, without value, but we know it's directly connected to power structures and the overall wokeism, too, <laughs> that whole dynamic. So you see people out with their, and you know, no knock to these people, but they've got their little poster out on their front lawn. And on our house, we believe in this, 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 and real, and then of course it's always science and then like transgendered, whatever, and black lives matter. So obviously uh, we're not dealing with some objective truth. Um, we are dealing with uh, power dynamics, which you so um, elegantly explain in your book. Uh, yeah, thank you uh, for that. Um, that. That is true. Uh, you know, on top of the fact that I keep inexplicably losing my audio, uh, there's now construction <laughs> outside my window. So, I, you know, the archons are really messing with us today. I don't know. Uh, we'll see what we can manage here. But what I was saying was this, that there's this is a very significant difference between morality and ethos. And part of what I'm arguing in Prometheism is that at the heart of what I'm arguing is that technological science has its own ethos. And this is what the myth of Prometheus is about. That, you know, if you're a, if you're a Muslim who wants to build nuclear weapons and rockets to take you to Mars where you can unfold your prayer rug and check your like, you know, uh, cosmological GPS so that you can point your head toward Mecca, right? You, you are, horrendously perverting technological science. You are using something that's the outcome of an ethos in a way that diametrically opposes that ethos, okay? And, and so it's a horrendous misappropriation. And the technological science doesn't belong to such a person. Technological science has its own ethos and it's an ethos based on Again, going back to the meaning of the word techne, which doesn't only mean technology, it also means art, like arts and crafts. Techne has an ethos that's about creativity and innovation and exploration and the will to discovery, right? I mean, these are very definite values and, and they're not at all uh, universal. They're rejected by many cultures. You want to see a culture where they're really deeply rejected? Chinese civilization, right? I mean, in Chinese civilization in general, uh, and we have to generalize to talk about civilizations or and their value system. In general, Chinese civilization is mortified of change. It's inimical to innovation. Um, it, do, it, it, it is uh, really wary of discovery when the Chinese discovered America. They discovered America before the Europeans did. 
they didn't even land, or at least if they sent out a couple of canoes, they quickly came back. And then when their ships returned to China, they had them burned. So they never explored the Americas, despite the fact that they happened upon them before the Europeans did. And it's because they're terrified of discovery. Okay, so there is an ethos which is epitomized by the figure of Prometheus that has to do with creation. Remember, Prometheus didn't just steal the fire for humanity to be able to innovate using technology and industry. Prometheus is also the creator of humanity in this myth. Zeus doesn't create humanity in Greek mythology. Prometheus is the creator of humanity, like Dr. Frankenstein. Okay, I mean, that's why Shelley called the book The Modern Prometheus. So creativity, innovation, exploration, uh, industriousness, these are facets of the ethos that's intrinsic to technological science as a world historical force. And that's what I'm trying to you know, embrace and forward with this movement of Prometheism. So technology, um, I guess you're saying, uh, or are you saying technology has created humanity and vice versa? And um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so and so here's the thing, here's the point, okay? So these people who are promoting soulless transhumanism, they at the very least misunderstand the ethos of the technology, the ethos intrinsic to, implicit in the technology that they're using. At, at best, they misunderstand it. At worst, it's a, on some level, deliberate attempt to pervert it in order to then catalyze a backlash against technology. Uh, because how is it serving creation, innovation, exploration to create a hive-minded cybernetic Borg species? That is not going to lead to further creativity and innovation. You're gonna wind up with a sterile society that, that is, is effectively the uh, cosmological equivalent of a cancer spreading tumors across other worlds in the cosmos, right? Uh, so that's not you know, um, the spirit with which Prometheus brought the fire to mankind. There is this notion that there is a malicious actor involved, um, you know, uh, Rudolf Steiner called it Aramon, uh, and maybe that these these folks that are, they are entrapped themselves in their known nihilism. Um, and that's actually uh, a more, I guess, benefactor um, way of looking at it, where it could be much more malicious, where they're uh, intentionally doing this to sort of enslave uh, so that they can be in their ivory towers and um, see that the true paradise where they see the materialism being, which is them having infinite life uh, through supposedly transferring their consciousness through machine, uh, while those, um, uh, you know, the profane, if you will, uh, are in smart cities uh, doing, uh, you know, doing what we're supposed to do, uh, which is live out our fatalist uh, existence of um, uh, being mouth breathers and, and, and just sort of, um, you know, going about our, our ways, uh, I don't know, I guess, uh, Brave New World style, um, you know, uh, enjoying uh, tons of entertainment and whatever the lower minded that they feel we are doing. So well, I get to this. So I bring this up. And my question is, where do you see the counter strike happening to this, whether whatever is pushing them, this Prometheus ideal, is this through decentralization? Is this through community building? How do we, where does this come from? Is this a new spiritual awakening? Where do you see this movement coming out of and how do you see it unfolding? I'm gonna be very direct in, in answering you because I'm, I'm at this point tired of mincing words. Uh, so anyway, we all first of are. all, First of all, the, the way you characterized the world that they want to see, the world that they want to take shape, I actually think that's part of the dialectical discourse that they're using. That's not their real end goal. That's that one false polarity of soulless transhumanism. But remember, that polarity, at least I think, is intended to catalyze a Luddite traditionalist reaction. And so who I think is really behind this is not like some group of transhumanists who want to upload their 
machine their minds to machines and so on and so forth. No, no, no. They, they're just using those people. Those people are useful idiots. Who's behind this is who has been behind the oppression of humanity from the beginning. And this again takes us back to the structure of the myth of Prometheus. Prometheus, interestingly, and this is what makes Prometheus such a complex figure. Prometheus is the one who helped Zeus come to power, right? Prometheus is not a god, he's a titan. And he actually turned on his fellow titans to fight on the side of the Olympians in the, in the Titanomachia and help Zeus come to power, right? So, but then he realizes that the Olympians are tyrannical and he, he doesn't want this creature that he's created, humanity, to be oppressed and tyrannized over. And so he leads a rebellion against the Olympians. Who are these Olympians? These Olympians are the same entities that the Sumerians referred to as Anunnaki, that you know the um, ancient Egyptians worshipped as gods. They're the same entities that, uh, that Zarathustra preached against when he turned on the devas. These entities have been manipulating humanity for tens upon tens of thousands of years. And another uh, important element of the Prometheus myth in this regard is the connection of Prometheus to Atlantis through the symbol of his brother Atlas, because the kings of Atlantis were named after Atlas. And Atlantis means the realm of Atlas. Uh, and so, and then it's after Atlantis is destroyed in this flood that's sent by Zeus, you know, the flood of Noah, which exists in, in the mythology of every single culture, major culture across the planet, that there was this great civilization and it, it uh, suffered from hubris, it rebelled against the gods, and then the gods punished it with this global deluge, right? It's the son of Prometheus, Deucalion, who helped save humanity from the deluge. So in the Bible, you get this completely perverse version of this, where the same God, namely Yahweh, both brings the flood and then chooses Noah to help save humanity from the flood, which makes no sense whatsoever. In, in the Promethean version of the story, it's actually the son of Prometheus, Deucalion, who's the Noah type figure who helps to save humanity from a flood brought by this horrible, sadistic tyrant, Zeus. So anyway, going back to the, the, the main question here, who's behind this, right? It's these Olympians. It's these, the gods, self-styled gods. And I think their ultimate objective is simply to push humanity back down into a position of subservience and submission uh, and to take away from us the kind of technology that would allow us parity with them, which would mean that we wouldn't have to serve them anymore and we could self-determine our own evolution and set our own goals, right? Um, and so when you ask how can the Promethean movement really take off, like what, what is, you know, at what point uh, does Prometheism have the potential as a movement to really transform the world? I think that will unfortunately only take place after some very cataclysmic events, catastrophic changes that we're about to head into, where I think the, the COVID pandemic was the first phase in a series of planned convergent catastrophes that are, that are going to you know, be engineered in order to bring this dialectic to a culmination, the dialectic between soulless transhumanism and traditionalist Luddite you know, uh, um, worldview. Uh, and so these catastrophes are going to be used in order to frame technology as evil, uh, as you know, ecologically degrading, as dehumanizing, and so forth, so that a deindustrialized neo-agrarian, neo-feudal system can be put in place with the discourse of how you know, it's more benevolent and it's more sustainable, right? We th they talk about sustainable development, at UN Agenda 2030 and all this crap. And it's only under those conditions that Prometheism is going to start to become very appealing to those who want to continue the trajectory of technological development. In a, an increasingly deindustrialized, increasingly totalitarian world, there are going to be people with significant resources who will resist that type of tyranny and will want to continue to innovate and explore. And as you suggested, 
they're going to need to have a decentralized system of organization, communication, and ultimately industrial manufacture and a decentralized economy, an alternate world economy outside of the control of these tyrannical globalists. It's the solar, I, it's the solar punks. Have you heard of this? No, I haven't heard of that. Uh, solar what? punks are people who embrace technology, but are also spiritually minded and, um, dis and also very much into decentralized community. So using the best of technology, but according to natural law. So they're very much yeah. in tune with voluntarism, but also community. Uh, there's a great festival that happens every year in Texas. Uh, and something I'm involved with through Cordal, with the idea of getting all the Cordal nodes out to all these cool homesteads and stuff. So it's not a Luddite um, uh, refusal of technology. It's an embracement. It's alphabetic to the core. It's like we embrace all the best of natural sciences and, uh, and spirituality, but also respect the technology of our art, our art forms, of our, of our own spiritual path towards creativity. So anyways, check out the solar punk movement, because I think you would, uh, you would, you would like it. Well, one thing that that um, you know uh, I want to pick up on in, in in how you framed that is that the kind of dichotomy that now exists between you know pro technology, let's say whatever you know pro singularity, let's say not to say transhumanist, but pro singularity embrace of technology um, versus let's say uh, spiritualist rejection of technology. One of the things that's going to push us beyond that dichotomy in the coming decades is that parapsychology research is going to become mainstream. Mark my words. Uh, as part of this plan to catalyze a, um, a Luddite traditionalist reaction against soulless transhumanism, we are going to finally have a restructuring of academia and of scientific research institutions that accommodates the type of parapsychological research that's been pushed to the margins of you know, science for the last century. And so in let's say 2035, it's not gonna be controversial anymore that you know, telepathy, clairvoyance, precognition are human abilities. And so when you have this uh, reaction of pro-technology people who wanna continue to innovate and create, when you have that reaction on their part against the totalitarian deindustrialization take place, those people are not going to be materialists in the way that Kurzweil and Harari and all that are materialists today. You're going to have people who have to deal with the reality of ESP and psychokinesis and so forth, but who also are pro-technology. And Prometheism is, is presaging that and encouraging it. So we're obviously in the middle of a controlled collapse. And I read in um, something in my research that the Prometheans would attempt to um, turn a controlled collapse into a controlled extinction as preferable over, uh, uh, let's just say, bringing us to a point of technological singularity. So let me clear up any misconception there. What I mean Thank you. is that as a movement, Prometheism embraces the motto of the American Revolution, give me liberty or give me death. Ah. So, and, and this is again, uh, not uncontroversial. It is not universal, mm -hmm. it shouldn't be taken for granted. I mean, you will never find give me liberty or give me death coming from out of the mouth of Sun Tzu, all right? It is not an attitude that you find in let's say Chinese civilization. Um, you know, they have the opposite attitude. Never fight a battle that you're not sure you can win, right? Don't take huge risks, right? Anyway, so, but no, uh, the American Revolution had this as its motto, and it's very consistent, frankly, with the Aryan ethos. You find this in, in all of the great Indo-European cultures. It's a very strong part of the Iranian mentality, uh, this idea of uh, preferring martyrdom to slavery. I mean, and the Greeks used to say, right, come back with your shield or on it. In other words, don't mm -hmm. be taken as a slave. Right? Death is preferable. So what I mean is that if there is a plan, and there is a plan, to deindustrialize the planet through manufacturing a bunch of converging catastrophes and manipulating the public response to them, and the objective of this plan 
is to create an animal farm here on earth from out of human society where we're all just a bunch of a flock of sheep or a you know herd of cattle uh, that have been put back under the control of these overlords that we had back in Sumer and Egypt and so forth. If that's the end game and they have a controlled you know, uh, plan for that, they have a, a carefully calibrated agenda, then I'm interested in throwing a monkey wrench or 10 into that agenda. Now, what does that mean? It means a lot more death. Have no illusions about it because these people, they want to depopulate the planet. Part of their agenda, because see, there are too many of us. You cannot create a totalitarian control system that successfully manages 7 billion people. It's just not going to happen. And they want to reduce the population to, I don't know, 20% of that, something like that. And they're going to do it through all kinds of methodologies, COVID and, you know, the, the, I don't want to get you banned again, but you know, uh, <laughs> there, there's various methodologies that they're going to use for depopulation. And so what I'm saying, huh? Uh, we'd be re-banned. We would <laughs> Never be? mind. I was, uh, no, oh, I was just uh, playing yeah. off of being banned. We'd be banned no, again. Yeah. yeah. Actually, so, we're honored every time we're banned. Yeah. Well, but I want this to wind up on YouTube and, and within the next week. <laughs> okay. We'll not continue Fair to enough. lay out exactly the various methodologies by which I think they're going to depopulate us. Uh, but my point is this, that it's a, it's a very carefully calibrated agenda. Now, if, you, if your attitude is like mine is, give me liberty or give me death, and you want to throw monkey wrenches into that agenda, then understand that you're going to wind up depopulating the planet to far less than 20%, because they, have, they, know, they know how they want to manipulate these variables. If you unleash chaos, well, more people are going to die, not less. And I'm willing to have that happen rather than for us to live in a global slave state. I'd rather there be far fewer people, but for them to be a free society, rather than for us to have, you know, be depopulated down to 20% and all we're left with are the sheep and the cattle. Yeah, what we're talking about is the higher principles of what it means to be human and what it means to be alive in this reality. And give me liberty or give me death comes from the understanding that there's more to life than um, the materialistic um, nuts and bolts that scientism talks about, that there is an afterlife or a reincarnation cycle. There's a spiritual uh, sort of ethical uh, uh, mission that we are on when we come into this plane, and that is a, of a higher order than just surviving. Uh, and in, in doing so, that is, it's funny because the one, of the, one of the many things that they have going against them is their fear of death. <laughs> and so we can play that to our own, um, you know, to our own abilities. Uh, that's why Bear and I have always been a fan of the alchemists and understanding, I, I've talked about this book a bunch, The Red Lion, uh, Maria Zeppis book. I don't know if you've ever read it, but it's a fictional tale of alchemists who come back, they, they reincarnate. And they can remember that is the philosopher's stone in the end is the ability to remember your past lives. Because if you can maintain that memory, then that fear of death goes away. And then you are now on a path towards enlightenment, right? Because now you know what your previous lives were and you're have gone. And the reason why we have that memory swipe is because we haven't matured yet to be able to handle that. But once you have matured enough to handle that, then you are on the true path towards, I think, uh, progressing this realm to somewhere that where it's supposed to go in the end. So that long story short, I think, yeah, um, where is the spirit when it comes to all of this? Where is God? Where is the creator? Uh, what is the divine purpose? And this comes down to, once again, the core philosophy, Neoplatonist, Plato, the idea that 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 thoughts and mind and that is um, that is what is fundamental over the, the, the physical stuff, right? So I want to uh, take issue with just one thing that you said there. One thing I do disagree with is that it's, uh, it's because we're not prepared to handle uh, the memories of our past lives that we are un unable to recollect them. <clears throat> and you find this attitude uh, among Buddhists in particular. Um, uh, according to some uh, accounts, 
Uh, Gautama said that it's better for most people not to remember their previous lives because it would be too burdensome for them. And, you know, a higher state of consciousness and sense of responsibility, whatever is required to be able to process all that, you know, this is one account of what Buddha, you know, one of the things that Buddha taught. I disagree with that. I think that this has been done to us deliberately. Um, I think if you look at all of the cases that let's say uh, Dr. Ian Stevenson at the University of Virginia studied over the course of three decades uh, of children's spontaneous memories of their previous lives, a lot of young children have past life memories. And the reason why they don't explore them and why these, these uh, memories don't uh, emerge fully from out of their subconscious into their consciousness and are integrated into their sense of personality is because these children are beaten down by their parents and other people in society. And interestingly enough, this takes place both among secular people and among religious people, right? So again, it goes back to that false al alternative that's been set up for us where you have this materialist uh, paradigm that has uh, been inculcated in a large group of people, especially in the Western world, and where parents will tell the kid who's starting to remember a past life, shut up, you know, there's all we are is matter, you know, don't lie, whatever, like don't make up stories because the parents are materialists. And then on the other side, you've got these brainwashed religious fundamentalists who let's say if they're a Christian say, say to the kid, don't talk like that, that you know, people are gonna think you've been possessed by a demon, a, a devil must be whispering these things into your ear, whatever, right? And they terrify the kid into thinking that uh, the kid is gonna wind up in hell if, if, if you know, she gives herself over to these uh, you know, demonic thoughts that are being put into her mind, right? And then it's not just the Abrahamic religions that are like this, even in the countries where you'd expect people would embrace past life memory like India, and Stevenson had a lot of cases in India, you find that Hindus or Buddhists or whatever also suppress their kids' past life memories because they think it's, it's bad karma to remember your past life and it's only gonna cause chaos in society, which by the way, sometimes it does because sometimes these kids remember having been murdered by somebody who's still alive. And a lot of these cases take place in small villages. And so the kids running around saying, he's the one who knifed me to death. Yeah. Right. And yeah. Yogananda talks about that. He experienced that. Yeah. So it's, it's problematic, but I think that it's a natural process and that it's being interfered with through the manipulation of human belief systems in order to suppress, uh, you know, our, potentially natural recollection of our past lives. And I would advocate for a type of society where um, recollection of past lives, hypnotic regression uh, therapy is sort of part of education from a very young age. And that people grow up integrating their former personalities um, with a lot of guidance and support from you know, real educators and from the community. Yeah. I. I uh... In my medical practice, I was uh, not exclusively, but very involved in that kind of work because um, on more than one occasion, it was um, very necessary for uh, that kind of recall in order for people to have the insight that would allow them to change their physical conditions. Um, we've been um, kind of alluding about a dark force. Touch on that for a minute, though. That's a very interesting. Oh, go thing ahead. Go ahead. And there, yeah, because I am somewhat familiar mm -hmm. with that idea. That and tell me, if, mm -hmm. tell me if this is what you meant. Um, sure. It appears that people can suffer from illnesses, diseases, or disorders that are a function of their previous personality and the their lack of integration of their previous personality. I don't want to use the term karma. I think it's it's laden with all kinds of potentially false implications, but from a more like clinical sense, that there there are diseases that are not diseases of the current organism, but they are sort of piggybacking on uh, past life memories that haven't been properly processed. They're sort of facets of uh, 
someone's spectral identity from previous lives, which until it's properly processed, won't be able, you know, there won't be able to be a cure to that kind of a, a pathology. Is that, is that what you were suggesting or? Uh, exactly. The only thing I would add is I uh, believe that the, our experience, our physiology is a composite of everything. So if we're interested in past lives, it's all on our lap right now. So there's no way you can separate the parts. It's, and, you know, when we get into some of our discussions in waveform physics and understand it's a continuous progression, and even our lifetime is a, a, a waveform comes and goes, you know, real no, uh, you know, death in the true spiritual sense. Um, we had ways um, since memories, uh, did you lose us? Oh, okay. So we lost. Uh, okay. Okay. He's going to come back in. Wow. It's like a time thing. It's very odd. Um, uh, Bear, yeah, I'd love for you to uh, expand upon this. And I think we're going to get into, um, Jason is a bit on the Gnostic side, that there are maybe potentially mentioned archons and characters that Yeah, that's, are... that's where I was trying to lead him to see if we're, if he's uh, thinking in terms of extraterrestrial, interdimensional, yeah. or whatnot. I uh, do... Just to, while we're waiting for him, to... go ahead, Mike. I was just going to say, and I'd love to bring up this idea that maybe this externalization of ETs or gods, in the end, that is still an externalization of our own inability to come to grips with who we really are. Um, and that we, they're like egregores, the gods are egregores that we collectively create out of our own inability to grow the F up. <laughs> Um, but anyways, uh, uh, here's Jason back in, uh, the, uh, the archons are at it. Uh, <laughs> speaking of archons, I only, yeah, this is terrible. I, I've never had this happen before. Not once. Anyway, very strange. Speaking I think of it's archons, probably Mike. I, I only heard the end of what you were saying there, but so correct me if I have a mistaken impression, but okay. I don't think it's just a question of us not, you know, growing the fuck up. I think that there are people who don't want us to grow up. They, they consider themselves gods and they have a paternalistic attitude toward us and they want us to forever be their children. And this is what the revolt of Prometheus was about. It was a revolt against this paternalistic control system. Uh, and so, so yeah, I would say, sure, a lot of people don't want to grow up, but these gods are really not helping things because they'd like to retard our development. They've been at it for a long time. Yeah, so, so um, I was just gonna complete the past life thing. I'll make it real quick. Uh, what we found, uh, because in, our, in my circles where we pioneered some techniques along this line, we were all uh, medical training and uh, very deep into medical neurology. So it's, it wasn't kind of a new agey thing, but what we found, consistent with the waveform mechanics, uh, you know, put forth by people like Walter Russell, is that the human nervous system is a electrical recording of everything that's ever been, and it doesn't go away. So we had neurological based techniques where we could go in there and um, get very accurate information through the neurology relative to past lives. And also there are hypnosis techniques out there, not so much what I did personally, but uh, people that have, uh, you know, advanced that in a, in a you know, very uh, predominant way. Um, so where I was uh, trying to lead us here is uh, just your thoughts on what we're dealing with. You know, for instance, you already mentioned China, and they seem to be more amenable to a control grid. Is that because they have been targeted by some dark force, uh, interdimensional, extraterrestrial, um, and, and of course, uh, uh, amenable to communism. So uh, what are your thoughts as far as where this sinister force emanates from in the first place? In the case of China, I think it simply comes back to civilizational values and culture. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Confucianism is an incredibly conservative, hierarchical, paternalistic um, belief system. And you can see throughout the course of Chinese history that everything that tried to challenge it from Taoism, which was native to China, 
right? From, from the, the Taoists to then the Chan Buddhists. Once Buddhism was brought from Eastern Iran and Northern India in, through uh, the Silk Route to China, Chan Buddhism couldn't survive in China. Both Taoism and Buddhism were horrendously persecuted by people with this terribly paternalistic uh, conservative Confucian mentality. And so I think that the collectivism of Chinese civilization is optimal for these, whatever you want to call them, archons or whatever, okay? Olympians, I like to call them. It's optimal for them to use China as a vehicle to work through. And probably they have been involved in building China up uh, as an economic and industrial power. And they've been involved through people in the West at a high level, various elites in the West, like the Kissinger circle in building China up to where uh, it would be a society with this Confucian mentality that would emerge as the economic and industrial superpower of the middle of the 21st century, round about the time when they want to fully implement this agenda. So that's what I think about China. And, I, and I'll say specifically, one of the things that really creeps me out is that clearly the Chinese have made a deal with these entities in terms of the moon. Because it is, and, and you can look at my book, Closer Encounters, if you want to see the argument for this, uh, my book on the UFO phenomenon, Closer Encounters. It's clear to me that when the United States abandoned the Apollo program, it was because uh, we had confirmation that the moon is occupied by these entities. And I say confirmation because we saw them before we even went up there. We, before. Apollo was even conducted, there were uh, clairvoyant, uh, there were, let's just say, clairvoyance used in order to remote view what was going on on the moon. Uh, but we received, I think, empirical confirmation during the course of Apollo that the moon is occupied and we were warned off and told basically to never come back again, right? Now, humiliation is the worst thing ever in Chinese culture. And we also know that the Chinese are working at a very high level with the Russians in their space program. And, you know, of course, Putin is a KGB man. He has access to all the KGB archives and so forth. And the Soviet Union knew exactly what happened to the uh, NASA astronauts on the moon and why Apollo was basically canceled. And so do you really believe that the Russians and the Chinese are building a space station together around the moon without the Russians having handed that dossier to the Chinese? Of course they have. And it's not as if the Chinese are going to go, uh, you know, replay the American humiliation in Apollo. They're not going to go, you know, without authorization to the moon to only be told they have to turn tail and come back to the earth. Uh, and suffer the same kind of defeat that the United States did on the moon. That's not consistent with Chinese culture and you know the, the, the horror of shame and humiliation in Chinese culture. So if the Chinese have this long-term plan to go to the moon and mine it for helium-3 and all this business, it's because they've made a deal. It's because they have been given authorization to do what the United States was not given authorization to do. And that deeply disturbs me. That, that signals all kinds of other things if that's the case. One uh, interesting anecdote on that. In um, years ago in my practice, I took care of a family who was one of those first folks up there on the moon. And, um, and I heard secondhand about other astronauts that I didn't know personally, all had the same experience and nobody could recollect a single thing about their experience up there. Uh, of course, some people would say they never went in the first place. Uh, you know, there's all sorts of different ideas about that. But I think uh, regardless of what you think, it's curious that the folks that, uh, you know, first set foot up there allegedly um, have no memory. And in fact, when they uh, had to go out in public and talk about it, some of them had a big problem and <laughs> and had some very severe physical symptoms uh, to the point where it almost took them out. Well, and I when you saw this in Closer Encounters. Yeah, when you see them on that, Armstrong and et al., when they're sitting there in front of the media, they seem shell-shocked. And absolutely. Uh, yeah, they're not, you'd think they would be absolutely exuberant about what they just did as national heroes. 
Um, and Kubrick, I, I am pretty much sure Kubrick did shoot um, the moon landing. However, there's two theories there. Either we didn't go or he did that because they couldn't show what's on the moon. Um, so he does seem to uh, elucidate that in uh, The Shining, that The Shining has been broken down to where that was his, his way of telling us that he did that. Uh, and that was the whole basis for doing 2001 um, movie was to develop the technology to fake the moon landing, uh, uh, you know, videography and everything. But that being said, in Closer Encounters, which uh, is phenomenal, I've been listening to it, as I told you, Jason, <laughs> on our road trips with our kids. Uh, and you're saying, I hope they don't have nightmares, uh, because uh, it definitely touches on a lot of frightening ideas about who really are those that are the Olympians. Are these the Nordics of the sort of tall whites, um, which you lay out as a really good hypothesis or theory that those are the ones that were working with the Nazis and that the Nazis never went away. Um, that really these potentially are the Nazis we're dealing with right now. And that, in fact, to me, World War II was, was just an extension of all of this drama playing out between the false uh, sort of, um, as you were saying, what we're looking at, the Luddites versus the supposed transhumanism. That's just continuing from there. And it's the Nazis pulling, um, pulling the strings. Uh, I know you wrote that book, what, two or three years ago. Where are you now with your final sort of thinking on on this so very long story short for people who have not read closer encounters i'm about to really bastardize myself here but uh but but i'm willing to do that um just so that viewers uh, listeners don't get the wrong impression um Look, I engage with every possible hypothesis of the UFO phenomenon in this book. I mean, that one of the one of the values of this book is that it it basically goes through every angle of possible interpretation of the phenomenon, and it also makes a case that, to an extent, they've all got something right about it. There's something right about each of the major interpretive paradigms for close encounters. But I ultimately arrive at the conclusion that two things are going on. That on the one hand, we're dealing with nuts and bolts UFOs that are flying time machines and the people in them, and they are people, although they also have these android robots that work for them, which we call the greys. The people inside these UFOs are time travelers who are basically totalitarian sadists, hell bent on the perpetual control of humanity, okay? So they want an, emp an, em an empire, not just in space, but an empire in time, which makes sense. I mean, sadly, I have to say, I mean, if you analyze human social psychology over the course of history, right? I mean, that's the next frontier. Suppose you conquer space. If time travel is possible, and I think a, a really strong argument can be made that UFOs are flying time machines, well, then the next frontier is time. So you, your object would be to conquer history. And I think that's one thing that's going on. I don't think that that's a comprehensive interpretation or rather a comprehensive explanation for close encounters though. I think some other very different thing is also going on. And that's that there is a trickster minded super organism at work in this world, which is capable of psychokinetically producing all kinds of manifestations in an interaction with human consciousness. And that this trickster has as its objective to foster further human evolution and to promote creativity. And these two forces, in my analysis in Closer Encounters, these two forces are at odds with one another. We're in a cosmic war between these time keepers, these masters of time, would be people who see themselves as the master race, right? I jokingly refer to them as the master race from space. And but really from out of time. Uh, and then on the other hand, this trickster superorganism that wants to help break us out of the control system that's been imposed on us by these sadistic controllers. And so the UFO phenomenon is an interplay over the course of history between these two forces. And you know, uh, you see you see uh, you see it in the Prometheus myth. I mean, the Olympians are these, master race, Nordic, beautiful 
people, right, who want to look down on us as their children, sometimes rape us, sometimes, you know, uh, play uh, terribly sadistic jokes on us. Um, and on the other hand, you have the Promethean liberator figures uh, from Prometheus himself to, I don't know, Quetzalcoatl in the Mayan culture to, you know, um, Enki in the Sumerian myths and so on and so forth. And I think these two forces um, have been in a dialectical struggle that basically has defined human history and and that's responsible for erasing what's become our prehistory. That you know th these uh, controllers have a vested interest in our not being able to properly remember what happened in Atlantis or what these wars that are recorded in the Mahabharata really were about. Where apparently it seems from these Sanskrit texts that nuclear weapons were being used potentially by both sides in this conflict. So that's uh, the larger interpretive framework that I uh, deploy in Closer Encounters. It is a fun read. And um, as someone who's been an avid UFO researcher since the late 90s, uh, you did a great job of compiling everything in a very upfront and well-researched way. Um, I haven't finished it yet, but um, the parts on the Bible are were really on point too. Um, and I know you kind of come from a very historical approach to Christ, but to me, the Christ figure could be another one of those um, counter figures where it brings forth um, a some remedy, if you will, uh, spiritual remedy to this sort of entrapment. And I know the Gnostics really kind of kind of got this better than most. Um, but that being said, let me, uh, let me your audience, because yeah. your audience probably is largely of the position that you are. And so let me just make this point here. Uh, which I've made in a number of my books with, with respect to that. Uh, look, my position is this, that I, I think in, in sociopolitical and geopolitical terms, going back to the beginning of our conversation, right? Like Plato, like Heidegger, I'm interested in philosophy making a difference in the world. And so I think a lot about the practical ramifications of the arguments that I deploy. And you know, I, I was reading Gnostic texts in my late teens. I was reading the Nag Hammadi Library at 16, 17 years of age. And I also read the biography of Apollonius of Tiana by Philostratus, you know, at a very young age. And so I'm aware, very acutely aware, of the possibility that there was some kind of a Promethean um, I don't even want to call him a savior. That's the wrong paradigm to look at things in terms of a Promethean liberator figure in Judea in those years that we think of as the lifetime of Christ. And there's also evidence to suggest both from Eastern accounts of uh, quote unquote Isa uh, and from the biography of Apollonius of Tiana written by Philostratus that whoever this figure was, he wound up surviving the crucifixion, traveling across the Persian Empire, and winding up in northern India, where he was ultimately buried. And so there's a, at an old age. And so there's evidence that there was such a man. But the fact of the matter is that forces of orthodoxy and I mean, really sadistic manipulation and control of the kind we see in the Catholic Inquisition, which had as its first target the Gnostics of France. Okay, so the first target of the Inquisition wasn't uh, Jews or Muslims, the way it later became in Spain. The first target of the Inquisition, the whole institution of the Holy Inquisition, was developed in order to eradicate the Gnostics, the Cathar Gnostics of Occitan of southern France. And so, look, the fact of the matter is that in terms of the narrative of Christ, orthodoxy or Catholicism won an overwhelming victory. And the only opposition to it wound up being an equally fundamentalist evangelical Christianity. I mean, forget the Quaker. I'm sorry, Quakers are nice people. They're nice. I've always liked them. But Geopol geopolitically speaking, right? They're irrelevant. And what matters to me is how Christ will be used 
by these totalitarians. And sadly, at this point, I don't think that symbol can be salvaged on a large scale for anything good. That symbol is going to be used together with uh, Mohammed and I'm sorry to say Krishna and various other deity figures in order to create a traditionalist world religion that will be part and parcel of this totalitarian control system. So look, if, if the Gnostics had prevailed in Alexandria, if you know, the, the Cathars had been able to carve out an autonomous realm in Occitan, well, we'd be living in a different history and Christ would mean something else. And I'm an empiricist and, you know, then we would be dealing with different variables. But as I see it, there's more value uh, in terms of um, archetypal psychology. There's more value in embracing Lucifer as the Christian version of Prometheus as Prometheus in the Latinate you know, uh, world, right? In the Roman Prometheus. Uh, and that the symbol of Lucifer and the power that it has to um, break us out of the control system through an inversion of consciousness in the violent sense in which Nietzsche was trying to catalyze awakening in people. I see that as much more constructive than trying to salvage Christ. Uh, so anyway, that's my position on that. It seems more than apparent now, too, that we're being orchestrated into a um, fundamentalist backlash and possibly even more dangerous in the long run than the woke culture, um, if that's possible. And um, I'm, we're headed in that direction. You know, the pendulum's just starting to swing the other way now. So, uh, you know, then you have Steiner had an interesting take on on Lucifer, you know, being the incarnation of an entity that was uh, promoting more uh, otherworldly experiences at the expense of being grounded in the here and now uh, and and you know uh, capable of manifesting on the physical plane and then you have Armon who is the other polarity who is uh, bringing us into this gross materialistic realm and then uh, you know the, the the plays back and forth what Steiner said was to uh, I don't want to use the term middle way, but to, you know, it's kind of right down the middle well, between. That's exactly what he, he middle way, and and you know, mm -hmm. for the anthroposophists in your audience, they should look at my argument against Steiner in Promethean Pirate. In my latest book, Promethean Pirate, there's a whole section where I I take apart this uh, position of Steiner, this system he sets up, this trinity, as it were, with Lucifer on one end and Ahriman on the other, and Christ as a mediator. I, I totally deconstruct that and uh, show the deep problems. I look forward to reading that. That was uh, due to your deep knowledge of Zoroastrianism? In, I mean, that's to begin with, as a point of departure, mm -hmm. Steiner totally misunderstands what Ahriman means. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, he's very consciously and explicitly admits he's drawing from Zarathustra's teaching, not to say Zoroastrianism, uh, when he uses Ahriman as a symbol, but he totally misunderstands what Ahriman means. Because Ahriman, I mean, if you want to, you can't find a better image of Ahriman than Yahweh. And, you know, Jesus says in the Gospels over, now I understand the Gospels are totally incoherent. Jesus is, it comes across as a schizophrenic bipolar maniac in these Gospels because he's constantly contradicting himself. But at least from out of one side of his mouth, he repeatedly says that he's the son of Yahweh and that he's come to fulfill the prophetic mission of the prophets of Yahweh and that not a dot of an I or a cross of a T from the law of Yahweh will, you know, uh, be irrelevant until the judgment, until the last judgment, at which point, by the way, he's going to sit as a judge with the elders of Israel and judge on behalf of Yahweh. This is what Jesus says about himself. And you can't find a clearer image of Ahriman than Yahweh. I mean, that is Ahriman. So, so anyway, long story. And Steiner short. is very clear that Yahweh is not the father. Yahweh is a sort of a demiurge type character. Yeah, but he's mixed up because he doesn't understand that. Uh, look, Ahriman is Yahweh, and that Lucifer is legitimately opposed to Ahriman. And anyway, it's a long, it's a long, complicated yeah. argument that I lay out in Promethean Pirate, where I attack him both on kind of like theological scholarly grounds 
and also in terms of what I think is a Gnostic dualist metaphysics that he's working with. I see Steiner as a, a kind of at least quasi Gnostic dualist, uh, where he has this very sharp distinction between the spiritual and the material. And I reject that. I mean, part of what I'm doing with Prometheism in terms of the, the ontology that I've developed uh, is through my concept of the spectral revolution to deconstruct the very binary between spirit and matter and to, to see the, uh, the paranormal not as indicative of another order of reality, namely the spiritual as opposed to the physical, but simply as aspects of nature that seem anomalous only because our minds have been conditioned by a false reductionist mechanist paradigm. And so as, as I see it, there's only one world, there's only one nature. Um, and, you know, uh, there's one universe, one, not a multiverse. <laughs> well, that's not another interesting subject. Uh, <laughs> but what I mean presently in a metaphysical sense is that uh, matter in the sense in which atomic physicists have conceived of it is a projection and a construct. And then to frame it against spirit is to, to, to be framing the spiritual in terms of what is already a false construct uh, and, and a distortion of, you know, of nature. Well, they sure uh, so, like to create those dialectics. And in your book, uh, Prometheus and Atlas, you do a great job of exploring Descartes and how he was basically an instrument of the church uh, and politically devised Cartesian philosophical, that, that dialectic once again, in order to protect the church. Um, another thing, I, I know we're running out on time, but another thing you, you mentioned in that book that's so amazing is you go into, about, into Freud and actually how he had some quote unquote paranormal experiences and, and, and really was engaging in sort of parapsychological concepts. And he was actually, um, I guess, told not to do that by his handler. And, um, but what this I'm leading into is this idea that the reason why this sort of, um, uh, what you call like the, the scientific revolution that wasn't allowed to happen in psychology was because it would have profound effects in society because that would mean that we would come to understanding that we are inherently psychic and that um, that opens up a whole can of worms for the controllers. And maybe that is the key to being a Promethean pirate as we move forward. Yeah, uh, so look, um, Freud thought that ESP, uh, telepathy and clairvoyance and so forth were the key to understanding the unconscious. But what he also understood is that this means that the id could wind up having an effect on the world. And that's very dangerous, that our repressed unconscious desires and so forth can wind up telepathically and telekinetically affecting other people, right? And uh, when people around him like Jones, uh, who helped manage his organization, became aware of this, Freud, Freud had written a number of speeches that he was going to deliver on this subject. After having participated in mediumistic exercises himself and having proven to be quite an adept medium himself, uh, Freud had written these addresses, which uh, his, his uh, associate Jones, uh, who I guess was a kind of manager type, didn't allow him to deliver uh, because he thought that you know, um, this was going to legitimate occultism and that it would basically destroy the reputation of psychoanalysis and so forth. But ultimately, I think he was terrified of what Freud had discovered about the potentially destabilizing social consequences of recognizing telepathy and telekinesis. Let me say something else about that, though, that goes back to what we were just talking about in terms of Steiner's Gnostic dualism and my problem with it. Uh, one thing that I love about Freud as compared to Jung. There's a lot I appreciate in Jung. And I think he was a great, very complex thinker. And you know, his notion of archetypes and the collective unconscious is totally legitimate. And uh, I, I appreciate the boldness of his thinking, his daring to even write about UFOs from an archetypal psychology perspective in the 1950s. But he's very transcendental, Jung is, in his approach. And the thing I love about Freud is how close to nature he is in his thinking. And so one thing that I show in Prometheus and Atlas and that puts the lie to Gnostic dualism is that you see 
telepathy in bacteria. There have been tests done on bacteria and yogurt samples that show that bacteria communicate with each other in sep across separate beakers, across a laboratory. You see something like telepathy and telekinesis at work in plants, which respond to human intentionality. And this exists at every rung in nature, all the way, of course, up to animals who are tremendously psychic, dogs and you know, horses and so forth appear to uh, fly. Oh no, we lost you again, Jason. Wow, it seems to be on a timer. Uh, maybe he'll just come in and we can have closing thoughts. He's on a roll right now. Um, I just, just makes me think, obviously, Bear, of what you know about, you know, uh, your, <laughs> your laboratory work with patients for decades seeing this in action with bacteria and we know all about this of course already and then it makes me think of Rupert Sheldrake and the morphogenic field theory and all that but in the end we're talking about the mental plane again and uh, or at least the field dynamics of, of of information the waveform mechanics it's waveform physics once again it explains it all <laughs> I yes. read, um, and uh is he back yeah, he's coming in right now, but um, yeah. Okay. And our talk last night was all about that, which is, uh, yeah. I look forward to that being released. Yeah, so anyway, sorry about that. So uh, what I was saying was that at every rung of nature from bacterium and plants up to various non-human animals, we see uh, you know, e what we call ESP and PK at work at a very high level. And Mm -hmm. This really puts the lie to Gnostic dualism. The spiritual is not separate from the physical. The physical world is spectral in nature. And it's only a question of how our perceptions are conditioned and limited by various paradigms. That oh. It happened again, Jason. This might be, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, guys. This is so weird. Uh, we'll probably one just last time. Yeah, one last time. We'll try to wrap it up. Time in. Um, okay, so yeah, I'm really enjoying Jason's mind. I always, you know, I I highly. Oh, it's amazing, and I'm uh, looking forward to reading his books. I'm I'm uh, yeah. inspired now. They're yeah. really fun. Um, Prometheus and Atlas was the first one I read, and uh, I actually immediately shared that to our Alpha Vedic uh, book list. And um, there's, I actually shared a interview playlist on the Alpha Vedic Telegram channel, the new, our news channel, and I shared it with you. I emailed it to you. It has all of his interviews with Jeffrey Mishlove on New Thinking Aloud, uh, which is which is nice because Jeffrey takes specific subject matter and really dials in on that. So highly recommend that playlist of all of Jason's interviews. And then his books, of course, Prometheus and Atlas. Um, so uh, uh, of course, if you're into the woo-woo, more woo-woo stuff, Closer Encounters is a really fun read. And uh, here he is. Hey, Jason. We can kind of we, get- We better, closing we better remarks. talk fast while you're still here. Uh -oh. Can you hear me, guys? Hello? Yeah, we can yeah. hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. This has never happened to me before. It's really bizarre. I don't know what the- What's going on? <laughs> Must mean we're on to something good. Um, I've, I've had so maybe we never like this anyway. Yeah. So, well, um, boy, there's so much more I'd still like to talk about. Maybe because we keep dropping off, we you know wrap it up with some final thoughts. You know, and there's a lot of things I want to share about experiments I've been involved with as far as cells in the body, microorganisms in the body, and how they. We've, we've actually proven out that communication that exists on different levels called telepathic or whatever. So uh, wonderful. And I'm uh, immensely looking forward to reading all your books after this conversation. We'd love to have you back on again. But that in mind, and Mike, uh, any final comments? Well, you I was have, just going to um, say, I've ahead. always foresaw that Jason could be a regular alpha cast, you know, every six months, have him come back on. He is a prolific author as well. So they're always like yeah. a new book to talk about. So yeah, go ahead. Bear. It would be my pleasure, guys. It would be my pleasure. I'd love to pick this up another time. Yeah. And I'm just wondering uh, why I haven't delved into your work early, but uh, earlier, but I'm really looking forward to it now. So uh, any final wrap up thoughts or things you'd like to touch on that we haven't already? 
Um, well, let me just add if, if, you know, if we get a decent connection for the next two minutes or so, <laughs> But I think mm -hmm. the most important point is you were talking about uh, distant mental interaction on living systems, basically psychic healing, right? And the, the thing that terrified Freud and the people around him, I think to some extent rightfully so, is that by the same token as uh, psychic healing is possible, psychic harming is also possible. And so if ESP and psychokinesis are to be successfully integrated into society, we need a profound transformation of consciousness to take place. And there are these totalitarians who are trying to transform consciousness in a particular direction that I think is, is going to be inimical to human progress. Uh, and so I think we need to very quickly um, present a really substantive alternative to that uh, for a kind of transformation of consciousness that brings uh, a new type of social cohesion, but not at the expense of individual liberty uh, and the autonomy of the human person. And so that's really what I'm fighting for with Prometheism, a way to unify society around a single ethos, but an ethos that's centered on liberty and individual freedom and personal responsibility. Brilliant. That's awesome. That's totally in line with what we're all about in our messaging. And then of course, um, we're providing uh, mechanisms to enact that in people's lives uh, and pragmatically, whether that be through understanding how to make your own food, make your own medicine, engage in community, new forms of, of currency, new forms of decentralized communication uh, and digital apparatus. So, uh, Jason, uh, I think we have a lot to talk about and much more to develop. I love the idea. I can't wait to read Promethean Pirate. That's not just the title alone. Is very attractive to me so uh and it's cool that you're getting into more fictional work because um I, i'm a tr and bear and i are true believers that it's through the fiction that becomes the reality it's through the imagination and the mind uh and we get too stuck i think oftentimes in modern times in this nihilistic sort of cynicism that that isn't the fact in the case but really that is where all the new stuff comes from <laughs> is from the imagination so i look really look forward and to reading that and and even though we uh, live off grid and grow our own food and and do all those things, we do uh, are uh, we favor greatly the integration of technology and we use it all the time. So I think there's a place for everything. And uh, so final, um, where can we find your work? What's the best place to uh, you know get your books, uh, your personal website? If you could share that. Yeah, I, I really need to update my website. I'll do that. It's it's jasonrezagiorgiani.com, just my full name, jasonrezagiorgiani.com. But people can go directly to Amazon and just search me, and all my books are there on Amazon. Just search Jason Reza Giorgiani on Amazon. And also, maybe if you can put a link in the description to the show to my YouTube channel in particular, because that's where all my latest stuff really is. The thing that's most up to date is my YouTube. Yes, so for me, atheism YouTube. Yeah, I will. I, I follow that and watch those interviews you've done. I love the stuff you've been covering on Iran. That's another show we could totally do and go into Russia. Uh, I, I'm curious your thoughts on Alexander Dugan and the fourth philosophy. All you know, I, I've got. Yeah, I have so many questions and thoughts in that direction. And I have a fascination with that part of the world and and Iran in particular. You know, I, as I mentioned, I almost ended up there. Um, yes, so, a lot of Americans yeah, lived in Iran in the seventies. When you were there, there were a lot of Americans living in Iran. Yeah, I know there were. Yeah. So uh, that'll be part two, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Um, fantastic. So I will put those in the show notes below, guys. Please go support that. And actually, you can get Jason's books at alphabetic.com forward slash book list. Uh, they're right in there. I'll put them all at the top so we get a little piece of that and uh, go uh, get and it's right on Amazon and you can get them there. So I'll make sure they're all on the top of the book list right now. And thank you, Jason, so much. This has been a, a wonderful chat today and we look forward to more in the future. Please go follow Jason's work and support him by buying the books. And you can uh, support us by going to alphabetic.com. Uh, give this a thumbs up and a share. This will be on YouTube uh, when you're probably, let it, many will be watching this on YouTube. So give us a thumbs up and share. That really helps us with the algorithm. Remember to get outside, get your hands in the dirt, grow, grow something, go for a nature hike. Uh, Mother Nature is a fantastic teacher. Go show her some love. And we will see you next week. Same bat, cha bat channel, same bat time, 10 a.m. Pacific time on Thursday. Thanks. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you.